Good morning. Welcome back. Feels like we only saw you just a moment ago. So uh, welcome back. Thank you for coming into our um, first full panel session of the morning. And I hope you enjoyed if you've returned uh, the fireside chat we had with Chris from Secret Sales and Callum uh, from Limworks, our sponsor. Um, brilliant start to the event. I'm sure you'll agree. And so uh, if you've joined us again, Good to have you back with us. You know how this works if you've been here before. Um, it's the Retail Bulletin. We have a brilliant panel. I'll introduce you to in a moment. Um, but we would like you to get involved. So depending on the device that you're using, somewhere on your screen, you'll find a QA. and a um, Please do use that Q&A button. My job as the moderator is to make sure that every question that gets asked gets answered. Um, and we pride ourselves on doing that before the end of the show, so to speak. Um, but yeah, do get involved. We've got tons to talk about. Um, I'm Darren, I'll be your moderator for the session. Um, thank you to the Retail Bulletin for having me back. I love doing these events. Um, I'm the exec chair at a men's skincare brand called Scrubbed. And uh, I'm also the founder of a consultancy called Williams Harding as well, which is into its fourth year. So lots going on there, but we don't need to know about me. We need to know about these people on the screen around me. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves um, and then we're going to start talking to them. Simple as that, really. So involved, use the Q&A um, and let's meet these people here. So if I may, I'm going to start with you, Deepak. Tell us about you and where you're from. Uh, but thank you very much, Darren. Uh, I love taking part in these uh, uh, retail because a lot has, lot has changed over the last uh, 18 months or so, right? So well, happy to have you here. Good. And uh, so my name is Deepak Ananda. I'm the Senior Director of Commercial Partnerships, Corporate Development at Big Commerce. So uh, it's it's uh, really exciting what is happening in this uh, current e-commerce landscape and the digital transformation. And I'm super excited to share my knowledge and to share what the data, with the insights I've learned over the last 18 months from uh, uh, being in this uh, pandemic situation. So thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks for being here. Paul, tell us about you, sir. Yeah, sure. I'm Paul Casey. I'm head of account management at an agency called Space48. Um, we're an agnostic agency. We work across a number of different platforms. Uh, we work more in the kind of mid-market businesses. So five up to maybe 150, 200 million turnover businesses. Uh, we do work in home and garden, health and beauty, um, B2B and a couple of other verticals as well. So um, hopefully I can share with the, the audience some of the learnings that we've had during this period of time um, of, of kind of crazy kind of roller coaster uh, of the last couple of years. Um, and hopefully I can bring that to the table today. So thank you, yeah. sir. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us as well. Yeah. Uh, Michael, tell us about you. Uh, yeah, I'm Michael. I'm head of digital at Mattress Online. Um, I look after basically everything in, in our e-commerce stack. So making sure that we focus on our UX and our conversion rate optimization and we make um, our business work for our customers online uh, and we're able to meet their needs and allow them to feel comfortable about buying uh, what's traditionally a high street purchase because you've got to have that comfort feeling. You've got to know that you're going to have a good night's sleep. We try to transition that online. Good to have you here, sir. Thank you for joining. Uh, David, tell us about you. Morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, David Conn. I'm the Marketing and E-Commerce Director for Heels, the much-loved and 200-year-old furniture and homewares company. I've been in retail an awfully long time. I started uh, back in the 1980s, would you believe? I've worked for a range of larger high street retailers, smaller high street retailers, specialists, generalists, but as I say, I've now alighted at this rather lovely brand uh, where I look after everything digital and everything marketing. Welcome, sir. I'm, I'm a fellow 80s child of retail as well. Radio Rentals was my, uh, my sojourn into, um, into retail where I spent five very happy years. So, uh, yeah, I was there with you on the, on the busy high streets as they were. Then they were, they were where it was all about. Um, last but not least, hello, Louise. Welcome. Tell us about you. Hi, um, I'm Louise Crottenden. Um, so I'm a marketing and innovation director. I spent a large chunk of my career at Diageo um, selling drinks, so brands like Guinness and Smirnoff and Bailey's. Um, so lots of experience in um, retail across grocery and uh, bars, clubs, etc. And then three years ago, I jumped out of that and went to a very different space into entirely e-com working on Huel, which is a complete nutrition brand one of the fastest growing brands in the world right now um, and spent three years there. And I've recently just jumped out and I'm rolling my sleeves up, helping various startup and scaling brands grow. 
It's great to have you with us. And actually, Louise, um, unexpectedly, is going to need to be called away uh, just before 11 uh, for uh, another engagement that she uh, needs to go to. So we have Louise with us just for a short time, but we still appreciate your time with us as well. So thank you. But um, based on the fact that you're going to have to dip out, we are going to start with you, if, we, if I may, Louise. Um, and you're going to kick off today's conversation in just a sec. Pre-warning for those of you that are regular at TRB events, Scamp is here today before any of you ask. Um, she's currently in one of the bedrooms. She sounds very quiet, so she's probably having another nap. But just pre-warn you in case she makes a sudden appearance. Uh, she is around, in case you're wondering. Let's do it. Louise, let's kick off with you. Um, this uh, webinar session is really about wowing at first glance online. Uh, I think the, you know, we talk about transformation a lot, but this session is just about making it pop uh, on a digital space. How, in your view, do you develop a fantastic customer browsing experience? Um, so a few thoughts here. The first one would be test, test, test. So A-B test everything. Um, the joy of online versus retail is you can see exactly what is happening and what is working and what isn't. Uh, and I think often brands can fall into the trap of huge effort going into big launches of sexy new sites and then sort of sitting back and, and watching what happens, whereas really iterating and trying lots of stuff. Um, every page on Huel.com, for those of you um, who have visited or not, uh, has been sweated and iterated on. Some of those pages have been there for seven years because they work. Um, you know, we don't tie ourselves in knots over having to be sexy and new just for the sake of it. Um, I think the other thing is often we worry about things being too beautiful. A great example was last year we launched Huel Hot and Savory, which was an entirely new category for us. And we spent days making uh, sexy product launch videos, which we had on our homepage and also our product page. And we maybe tested them versus a much simpler page, which was just a static image of the product with some clear callouts. And the static image smashed conver conversion rate versus the video, which was gutting because we all loved the, the sexy product launch video that we'd spent lots of time making. Um, but it just goes to show you, you know, we, the, the marketers in us want, want the beautiful, um, lovely things, but it doesn't, doesn't always work. And I guess the other last thing is listen to your customers. Um, the biggest things our customers at Huel were telling us was, it's quite a complicated product. They just wanted simple information about what was in it, how they should use it. They found the subscription page complicated. Um, so some of our biggest work just went into having a constant top five complaints that our customers were telling us about the site um, and constantly working on those. So like improving our subscription page was, a, was an ongoing um, passion project for the business until we got it right. So yeah, really listen to your customers. I'm interested that some of the pages were, I think you said seven years old, because there's, there's a real element there of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? If it's working, just, you know, did you do any tweaks to it at all or did it just pretty much remain the same over those years? Um, obviously tweaks in terms of copy, images, you know, we moved to more sophisticated platforms, but the essence of the page was the same. You know, it was simple copy, simple images, um, telling people what it was, not letting stuff get in the way, um, and iterating, you know, uh, constantly. We, we constantly had dozens of A-B tests running um, to see what was working, and the results were always surprising. The stuff that you thought would work often didn't. That's great insight. Thank you, Louise. Thanks for kicking things off for us. I will come back to you again before uh, you head off. And if you do have a question for Louise, use the Q&A button and I'll make sure uh, she gets it before she leaves us. Uh, Deepak, I'm gonna to come to you if I may, sir. Um, so uh, that's it, you're off mute, you're, you're already prepared. I haven't done a single you're on mute yet today, which is great, so far so good. Um, we talked in our earlier webinar this morning with, uh, with Chris and Callum around website ability. And you know, those websites that are somewhat out of date and unable to do certain things. And, how important is a website's ability to scale with kind of those best of breed integrations that we're seeing now, like payment platforms, shipping, personalization? Is that important? What do you see in this? I think uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I get to uh, ask this question a lot of times because actually my background is I was 
I was running, uh, I was a part of Magento before joining BigCommerce. So I've actually seen an open source technology versus a SaaS technology. And now uh, BigCommerce is pretty much an open SaaS. So what we have, uh, seen when you talk about the scalability, uh, this is a critical part because I think what we do not have in this current environment is time, right? Uh, as Luis just mentioned about test, 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 but you also need to understand that how can you go tactical and how can you go fast? And if you have to do a lot of testing with the apps and uh, with the versions on the open source versus the SaaS technology, you really want to make sure that integration it should be a one click. So we have a lot of integrations when we talk about big commerce with 80,000 plus customers globally. We have a lot of uh, payments are pretty much native integration. So you can have payment integrated into big commerce and with, a, with a few clicks and you can scale globally pretty fast. And then when we talk about all these search and personalization and all, so most of the apps has been certified by us so that it could be a one click install. It all comes down to time to market and fa how fast do you want to, do you want to, uh, do you want to grow and do you want to launch? So these, this is a critical part for the success of any of the e-commerce launches. But as you know, that there are so many, we work with likes of Ted Baker, we work, work with uh, Benson's for Bed, some of the bigger retailers here. And when we work with them, we just want to make sure that it's not going to be any more a three years or two years or 18 months of project development or a website development. It's pretty much like a few months so that they can quickly go test it and pivot pretty quickly uh, using the right technology and using the right uh, integration. So it is critical for the success of e-commerce now, especially what has happened over the last, you don't want to miss out uh, the customer loyalty and you don't want to miss out the customer experience as well at the same time. So it is critical. Uh, sorry, I I just given you a longer answer to this simple question. Yeah. Yes, it is it is it is important uh, to have the right integration, best of breed. But you always have to understand that what what do you want to achieve from these type of technologies as well. So it, it was a perfectly good answer. Thank you, sir. Longer, yes, but insightful, absolutely. So don't worry about that, and I'll come back to you again shortly as well, Michael. On the world of online mattresses, I mean. Uh, how do you understand your customers and what's driving the purchase? I guess for you guys, people are visiting you purely for necessity, right? Or am I wrong? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's understanding what your customer's driver is. Why are they purchasing? And what do they need to know to feel comfortable with their decision to buy from you and to buy the product they're buying? And you need to reflect that against the fact that pretty much the most valuable commodity in the world is a customer's attention. So the information needs to be in front of them immediately and the information they want needs to be there immediately. So focusing on that rapidity and simplicity of the information, uh, calling out what the key things are. So it, it's, um, as Louise said, it's A-B testing stuff when you can't directly talk to your customer base uh, to see what works and what doesn't work. What you'll probably find is your team is aware of your market, they're aware of technical skills. If you've, if you've got a you know, development team or UX person or digital marketers, they're tech first people, but your customer base might not be so tech focused. Uh, if you can do some real world user testing, moderated user testing and get that real experience of, of what users do and don't understand on the site and really map out and understand what does one of my customers need to know to make a purchase what's their decision tree in picking a mattress you know what are the forks they need to go down to end them up in a product that they're comfortable choosing and you need to just apply that and focus on making that key information super simple for the customer to see and receive you know if you've got a video product launch uh, that's great for someone who's got the time to look at it but maybe the simpler pictures worked better because someone could go oh there's a new product i've seen that i've moved on have they got the time and the engagement with your brand to sit and watch a product launch video or do they just want to get to the information? And, uh, you know, as Louise said, I found it very surprising the results of some of our AB tests that we've done. We've driven analytics data out of usage and scroll depth and time on page. And we've gone, well, obviously our customers would rather see the video in the carousel. So we moved the video up to the carousel and the engagement rate in the video dives and the conversion rate for the product dives. So how do we understand that without getting a customer in front of us? Um, we can't necessarily do that, but it's, it's removing that technical friction as well. Understanding that one of the key things of the pandemic is it accelerated online shopping massively, but that means we've reached people who wouldn't have switched if they hadn't had to, and their technical barrier to entry is higher. So it's just that simplicity, keeping it, it's there straight in front of them. It's got the information they need and they know where to start. I think that's the key thing that we've learned. 
Thank you, sir. And a nice segue into you, David, actually, because you've done some, I know you've spoken about this before in, in various events, but I think it's good for our audience to hear again about what you've done around the live chat solution that connects customers, you know, online customers with your in-store teams. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, of course. I think uh, just to, you know, take on board what Michael said there, the understanding the way the customer shops, um, understanding how they make choices is absolutely critical. Um, there's a tremendous amount of choice available to all of us now. Buying anything, not least a mattress, is, is an almost impossible task. So I think as a retailer, you've really got to think about what it is you're going to do to help the customer get through that choice and alight on the right product. And then once they've alighted on the right product, how can you provide the reassurance that they're not buying the wrong thing? Because actually the fear of getting things wrong now is probably greater than the, the pleasure or the, the expectation that they'll get it right. So the live chat solution that we use um, comes from the product page, tends, tends to not be used much before the product page, so it can be. And what it does, it connects the online customer to one of our store specialists. They all carry around an app that's on their, on their phone and assuming they're not dealing with a face-to-face -face customer at that point in time. And let's be honest, stores are not that busy right now. So there are plenty of our teams who, who have that availability that member of the store team can deal with the online query. What that's doing is, it, is it's addressing one of the, the, the massive issues in online experience, which is wherever you put your information, however much you've got, however simple it is, however easy to access it is, there'll still be a huge body of customers, A, who don't see it and don't find it or don't read it, and then there'll be people that simply want the reassurance of talking to a real life person. And uh, I, I would certainly fall into that category myself. You know, when, when buying anything, it's just bewildering the amount of choice. And so for me, the, the opportunity to talk to somebody real um, is, a, is an important part of making these high ticket purchase decisions. And I'll just give you a little example. Um, uh, when I go out to dinner, my kids are now in their 20s, so they've gone past the age of being super embarrassed by dad, but they're still pretty embarrassed because every single time I look at a menu, I'll ask the, the waiter or waitress, is the, is the lamb any good or is the beef any good? And, and as soon as the, the, the waiter or waitress has gone, inevitably having said, yes, it is, they'll say, well, what, 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 was, what was the point? What was the point of asking that? They're not going to say, no, it's terrible. You know, the, the last person that ate it died. They're going to say it's good. I said, I know they're going to say it's good. It just makes me feel better to hear them say it. And I think, I think there's an awful lot of that psychology that you've got to take take on board with an online experience. So for me, humanizing that that online experience really important. Just to put some bold facts on this, uh, conversion is about ten times the average for the site if people engage with the live chat solution, an average order value is between 50% and 100% and more. So uh, it's delivering between 15 and 20 times the revenue per visit that a, that a standard visit would have. So not only is it good for the brand, not only is it good for the customer, it's also extremely good commercially. It just feels so accessible as well. I think, I think look, uh, uh, you know, there, there'll, be some, there'll be some people in the audience, there'll be some of my fellow panelists who are using AI potentially for product advice. Um, fundamentally, uh, AI isn't at the level yet where it, it really provides that reassurance that, that customers need. And uh, I'm not convinced it will be there for some time yet. It can deal with simple service queries. It can deal with a bit of product guidance. But when it comes to the crunch, when it comes to adding a product to the basket, when it comes to completing the checkout, it's incredibly help. You know, humans didn't evolve in the last 10 years. Humans have evolved over um, millions of years, yeah? And, and, and that social connection is an incredibly important part of the way in which we behave and the way we make decisions. So to incorporate it into the online experience 
to bring real people into the online experience, I think is is a is a real a surprise development in a way. But it but it's a, it's a fantastic development. Mm. Live, so, live so, chat was super important for Hugh as well. It, it really worked, and and our stats were similar in terms of conversion um, increase with people interacting on live chat. So it was a really important channel. You know, it's, and it's Paul, been the you same are not for us with uh, live chat being really important because of the confusion of the market. You know, it, AI wouldn't work. Yeah, AI is getting better in terms of a chat response, but you can tell you're talking to a bot and it gets frustrating. And when you are trying to make the information instantly available and humanize it and make it feel comfortable and friendly, AI doesn't cut it yet for certainly for our customer base. Yeah. One of my worst ever bot experiences was Vodafone, but that's another story. Uh, Paul, you were nodding away at that subject. Yeah, a lot of our clients are really changing the emphasis of what live chat historically is, which is more of a customer service function and focusing more on like a sales function and a, a product discovery function. And instead of, um, you know, just dealing with issues, it's actually proactively getting people to the destination because, you know, you can do that through search and content and all the other traditional ways. But I think David's right, you know, that a lot of the consumer behavior, it's always good to just speak to an expert on the other end of, you know, chat or phone or even face to face, obviously, uh, in a traditional retail sense. So I, I don't think we should try and replace that. Um, I think we should encourage it to, to continue online, but do it through a different means and live chat. It, it does work well for our clients as well. Thank you, sir. Um, what I, what I would add, Darren, if I might, is, uh, is yeah. I think one of, one of the things that's been lost a lot in e-commerce, or not so much lost, but has never really been considered. Most people in e-commerce come from quite a technical background. They're, we're typically sort of your left brain, numerate, logical people. And so we're always looking at the user journey in terms of it being a flow, in terms of it being a decision tree, in terms of being logically driven. But actually, um, you, you know, that's what we know now. That this is not the way that the brain works, that the brain is incredibly I'm not saying irrational, but but it's it's emotionally driven. And most of the decisions we made are made by a bit of the brain that was about as developed as it is now, 10 million, 10 million years ago. And you know, it simply hasn't, that bit of the brain, the way we, we do things hasn't changed. So I think creating an emotional connection is is incredibly important now. And most of us who work in this industry aren't very good at it. We're very good at uh, you know, creating navigation structures and creating customer flows and looking at checkout. But we're not as good at thinking about what, what is it that's really going to create an emotional connection with our customers. And for a brand like Heels, where, you know, the product is great, it's incredibly high quality, but, but we still have to persuade a customer that this is going to improve your life. This is going to, this is going to make you happy. And, and you can't do that with a logic flow. Thank you, sir. I'm going to come to Louise very quickly because I'm conscious of time and you do need to head off. So um, I'm going to pivot the conversation slightly to presentation of products online um, because uh, we've done a lot of talk there around using AI and, and communicating with customers. But some retailers get presentation of products, such a simple, basic wrong. What would your uh, advice be on improving presentation of that online? Um, so I think there's a real difference and you can see the difference between products that are direct consumer products that are developed to be on e-com sites versus retail products that are developed and designed to sit on a retail shelf in a real shop. Um, and, and I think people often make mistakes just doing the same thing as if you were picking it off a supermarket shelf versus if you're actually buying it on site. So again, to use a Huel example, Huel was a, an entirely e-com brand when it was launched and for the first few years. And our product was developed to stand out on a website. So it's very clear and it assumes that the consumer will be looking at on a tiny thumbnail, thumbnail on a site. And then you will have actually already bought the product by the time it arrives in your house. Um, so it was designed that way and really worked on site. Whereas you often see retail products that are then popped on um, a site and it's, it just doesn't work. And actually either the images of those photos or the, the information surrounding them isn't working hard enough. 
I was looking at a household cleaning, a sustainable household cleaning product brand the other day, and it, the, their site was just full of beautiful pictures of these products that obviously worked on the supermarket shelf, but I couldn't actually see what they were on the website. And actually the reporting information around about them wasn't working hard enough. So I think particularly for retailers who are doing uh, actual real life bricks and mortar shops and online, you really have to think about them very differently in terms of the presentation and make supporting call outs, information, scream at the shopper. Just like you wouldn't let anything else get in the way of you in front of a supermarket shelf. So don't let stuff get in the way of you as you're trying to make people click click on site. So think very differently. Thank you for that. And um, a very quick thank you as well for your appearance on the panel. Feel free to skedaddle when you need to. Uh, so just click leave and you'll disappear from our screens. But just a moment now to say thank you very much for joining us. Fine. And uh, we'll look forward to having you back on future panels as well. Michael, pick that point up from Louise from a online mattress retailer. How important has the presentation of your products been and how, how do you get through some of the challenges? I think ultimately with mattresses, it's exceptionally challenging because yeah. mattresses are the thing that you hide in your bedroom. So yeah, it is about um, not so much a purchase based on aesthetics, but the product does need to look high quality and professional and all that kind of stuff when you're buying it online or it will put people off. So um, mattress photography is challenging. Everyone in the industry uses CGI images of the mattresses now, uh, and it's trying to convey that impression of the comfort visually um it, by putting it into a room set and giving you an idea of, of how that's going to look you know look on a bed um only has limited appeal for a mattress because the way it's going to look on a bed is hidden under your excellent choice in um bedding um ultimately so it's driving that supporting information and making sure that's there what are the key benefits of this product why am i picking this particular mattress over any other mattress and how do we demystify the industry terminology around the mattress pocket sprung memory foam gel there's so many uh, different things and as you said earlier i think it's a it's a purchase of necessity rather than passion so there's that getting over that barrier of i need to understand all this stuff in something i am not super interested in to purchase so it's really being able to call out why this mattress will make you comfortable and to make that customer comfortable with the choice to buy it um it is a big bulky purchase it you know it, if you've ordered the wrong thing and you take it off your bed where are you going to store that king size mattress that you want to return and what are you going to sleep on the next night if you're super unhappy with it um so making sure people are presented immediately with this is why this mattress and if these aren't the right points for you look at something else uh, Got it. that out. Deepak, I want to come back to you, if I may, and sort of go back to that conversation we had earlier about ability. And, and again, another thing we, we covered off in the first session this morning uh, was about people's existing e-commerce platform having the uh, ability to not just do all the stuff we spoke about before, but scale. And uh, what happens when brands find themselves outgrowing their existing platform you know and i think some of the challenges is that retailers watching today may feel there's too much cost involved or there's too much pain involved to move to a new more efficient platform or a, a platform that can enable scale what's your view on that i mean uh they, so change is always difficult uh that i always believe right even changing a mattress so I had to, I've just got a six months old baby and I had to change the mattress because I wanted to make sure that when he sleeps on the mattress. So I didn't buy it from a uh, mattress online, but I should have done it. You know, uh, I didn't realize that I was on the panel with him. So <laughs> Michael, next time. So, uh, but, the, but the one thing which I'll say is that it is difficult, but it is sometimes necessary, right? But what I'll say because of the technology advancements, which has gone through in the e-commerce platform space over the last few years, that the change, the, the change which you are expecting, the painful change you are expecting doing it on a, some of the monolithic and old e-commerce plat platforms is not going to be, uh, or it's it's not going to be uh, the same. Because when you think about the SaaS or open SaaS, which is big commerces, we are giving you the flexibility on the front end, and we are also actually taking all the pains away from uh, like what you had to do with the open source technology in terms of upgrading and all these type of things, security patches, BCI compliance, and all these type of things. So from where exactly the merchants were a few years ago, and now when they think about the new technologies which are coming out, which is more about the 
it, it all comes down to the which segment of the market you're targeting. Uh, I mean, obviously we are a part of Mac Alliance, which is microservice architecture and API and all these type of things so that you would be able to make all these changes pretty fast and quickly. But this is an investment you have to make. But there is, I would not say that it's, it's seamless. It is seamless, but it requires uh, effort and it requires a little bit of, uh, you know, you have to challenge how exactly uh, you want your e-commerce or your online to look in the next five years or 10 years because these things are changing and I, actually i wanted to pass it on to paul actually this question because there are preferred agency in a number of cases lovely segue. i was going to do the same yeah so i think uh because if you think about this thing uh darren we are just the enabler right the key one is that uh the retailers work with very closely with a company like space 48 so just to because we provide you the right technology if the agency is not the right fit, whether you have the best of the technology, if you're driving Tesla or if you're driving any other, if you don't know how to drive it in the right pace, it's going to mess up, right? So I think I'll pass it on to Paul just to say how they have done Sarah Raven with us. They have done a number of massive projects with us. So uh, Paul, how you have taken that approach of selecting first the right e-commerce platform because you are agnostic on e-commerce platform as well. Yeah, it's it's one of the, it's probably in the last two years something that's happened more frequently than maybe has done in previous years, where people have experienced so much growth and they've just realised the technology stack or, you know, the platform it's just not fit for purpose for where the business needs to be today or where it needs to be in the future. So, I think breaking down where you know where the challenges might be, um, you know, we have a lot of clients who might be working on on prem and they're having server issues or they need to do a server migration because they their existing tech infrastructure isn't really built for their new normal traffic levels and transactions and everything else. So therefore maybe like a SaaS model like BC might be more suited. I think as well, it's not necessarily just the platform. I think the platform is a, is a key aspect, but it's sometimes the ecosystem that sits around, you know, that, that actual platform. Sometimes people have a bit of a mismatch when it comes to third party tech you know, they're not reviewing it regularly enough and they're not really, um, you know, utilizing the actual tech. So, uh, you know, it's sometimes clients will come to us and they don't need to re-platform. They just need to reconfigure how they actually approach things and then, you know, in, improve it from there. You know, most clients that we work with might only be using 20 or 30 percent of the potential of the platform that they're on. Um, and really, it's just opening up the opportunity to. Um, if a replatform isn't an option, uh, to really maximise what they've already invested in, um, and and to invest further in in their existing tech stack. So, yeah, I think Deepak. Obviously, we've we've worked quite closely with you guys when it's come to a mismatch in terms of where they're at, and almost like the changes that have happened over this period of time. And it, you know, they need something more scalable. You know, like a like a big commerce, for example. And uh, thank you, guys. And by the way, I have the world's most efficient panel as well. So uh, thank you, Rob, for your question. And you've already had your question answered by David and Michael. And uh, I've seen you said thank you for that as well. So thank you for your question, Rob. And uh, I'm glad that you got the answers that you were looking for. Um, and can I just remind you all, we've got a, a good 20 minutes or so left yet. So if you want to um, get your questions in, we've got plenty of time uh, if you want to get any questions over to our panel. You are so welcome. The audience is staying with us, gentlemen, as well, so always a good sign. Um, David, I'm going to come back to you. Continue that conversation for me around, um, I guess, capability of website and so on. What, what's been the experience at, at Heels? When did you last kind of move platforms or do something massively transformational in the online space? <laughs> yeah, about a month ago. Um, yeah, um, yeah. We just uh, we re-platformed to Deepak's old employer, so um, we moved to Magento. But I, I think um, uh, that was more more a, a re-platform of convenience than anything else. And I think um, I was interested in what Michael said about the the product page. And I think that's an area where uh, we really focus. You know, I think of, of all of the areas of the website, the product page is the one which makes the most difference to your performance. Ultimately, you've got to get people to that product page, but once they're on the product page, you've got to do a whole series of jobs to try and uh, get them to the finishing line, you know, to get them to, to that sort of glorious add to basket moment. And uh, it was very interesting hearing Michael talk about uh, the way that they look at uh, mattresses. We sell mattresses as well. I'd say I find it very difficult to communicate uh, what the pros and cons of diff different mattresses are. 
And if you've ever been tried, tried on mattresses, it's, it's almost impossible. But some of the things we've done, uh, I think the massive thing for heels is, uh, is how things look. Um, and it's both creating the desire, um, you know, when people look at a product that say they've got to imagine that they own this, they've got to feel that this would be an incredibly desirable product for them to own, that's it's going to enhance their home. But also you've got to try and create a little bit of stickiness because if they do show an interest, you've got to find a way of, of engaging them in, in that product page. So we invest a, a huge amount of money in lifestyle photography. Um, uh, it's probably the, the biggest single ongoing investment that we make uh, outside of our digital marketing. But the other thing is in terms of technology, we've gone to a lot of lengths to try and uh, help the customer see what products would look like, um, particularly, for example, sofas in the different fabrics. You know, we can't photograph every sofa in every fabric because in truth, um, some of those sofas will never be made in that particular fabric, but we're offering it to the, to the customer that wants it. So we've invested a lot of money in uh, rendering technology, which enables the customer to see all of our sofas in all of our fabrics. Um, gives a 360 degree image, gives an incredible close up quality. The, you know, the way in which these uh, technology companies achieve this is incredible, but what it does do is it gives all of our customers a chance to see what the product really looks like um, and to almost to feel the fabric, although obviously they can't actually feel it without ordering a sample. I think all of that is gonna move on um, in the coming years. We, we've already seen some pretty naive attempts at AR, some of which we've tried ourselves. Uh, they don't tend to, to work very well. But I really do see uh, the, the development of this moving into more VR and potentially the fusion of gaming uh, and, and retail, whereby you'll be able effectively to wander around a store or, or wander around your home and, and place items in it. We have, again, a fairly simple room planning uh, software where people can look at things and how they sit together. Um, and uh, we're also working separately on creating uh, 3D tours of, of our, our main store, um, which are actually shoppable. So I think all of, all of this is gonna come together in the next two or three years, so that you're able to visualize the product that you're buying in the context that you wanna see it, which is generally uh, your own home. Certainly for us, the, the product rendering technology has been absolutely uh, essential to, to our sales of sofas and upholstered beds. Uh, without it, you know, without it, we would sell barely any. And, and now it's a very sizable proportion of our online turnover. Thank you, sir. And um, we have another question. I'm going to put this to uh, Michael, if I may, and then I'd like Paul to uh, to uh, come in on this question as well, please. So this is from Rob. Uh, he's basically saying a general question here. We've seen that real shift from bricks to clicks, and we are carrying probably now about a third too much physical space in the high street. Have you got the same concerns that if we have too much clicks, too many choice, where do I start, who do I choose, and so on, that we could get the same kind of customer fatigue in online what do you think michael yeah i mean that, that's one of the the great things about the internet is um the you know a small concept that wouldn't work regionally can work because it's it's global but on the other hand you can be overwhelmed with choice so uh, for me it's it's about <clears throat> making that customer comfortable to buy from you what, what is it that's differentiating you from someone else you need to find a way to stand out which i guess is what this session is about and and it's about that uh, making it super accessible for the customer. And I think what David was just talking about with, um, I think we've got the same challenges that they have. We've got a, a product that's traditionally, you want to feel it, know it's comfortable, have a sit on it, have a lay on it, and you want to know what it's going to look like in your room. So driving that hybrid model of finding a way of taking your digital presence into people's houses uh, with AR and things like that and driving... Um, the hybrid model into your, into your brick space, I think we see the idea that 
uh, the classic model of a shop being more like a supermarket where people walk in, pick stuff up and go to the till and check out is, is where the retail on the high street suffering. It needs more of that personal shopper experience, more of that. Here is a sample of what we've got. You can feel the fabric, see what it looks like. Uh, but then we'll do a guided, uh, you know, an in-store um, concierge can then uh, guide you through the effectively an online guided process and, and it's, access the full range of your products that you couldn't possibly have without having an enormous expensive to run store that the footfall doesn't support. So smaller retail units with a more consumer engaged presence, certainly in, in our market sector, um, whether that crosses into every market sector, I'm not so sure, but. Well, what's your view? Too many clicks, too much choice, online fatigue? I, I, I don't know about that because for me, um, the convenience of online now, uh, you know, and, and the progression, because I think, you know, we're, we're still relatively speaking early days in terms of e-commerce. Like, I think that the ease of how you can get things delivered, you know, you can get things delivered same day. You know, there, there are some real convenience factors here, you know, without actually leaving the house that that are really good. But for me, the, the challenge isn't necessarily is is one going to outweigh the other because i think online is is pure convenience and will win ultimately for me it's about experience and how can i can create an emotive experience with a brand it's very difficult for somebody now to try and create the same experience as what it's like when you close the door and test drive your first car or if you you know you sit on the mattress or you sit on the you know when you do that thing probably um david knows about this where you sit on the sofa and you feel this like you actually it's, a, it's an emotional, like a human attachment um, uh, kind of thing that I'm trying to put across. So for me, I, I think that that's the biggest challenge is to, is to recreate that something that, you know, it's great having this virtual event, but ideally I'd love to be in the same room as you guys with an audience and, and you just can't recreate those human elements. So for me, I think the challenge is for how does the high street or how do retail, traditional retail brands now operate in a competitive online environment, which is essentially, and you could describe it more as a price comparison and discovery more than anything. Um, and how can you create that kind of uh, connection to the customer from an emotional perspective? Um, I think that's still possible from a high street perspective. I think these kind of more pop-up style, you know, instead of having large retail units, maybe having smaller scattered across a larger geographic location will be a better strategy because then you can almost you can connect with people in a, in a um, direct physical space. Um, but I think the transition to online, it's already here. Um, it's really just how can you make that emotional connection. And, and Deepak, you and Paul have done some work together. What, what Do you want to share what that work has been? You're there. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of the... Uh, in terms of the reports, we have done a lot of lot of reports with the. I mean, I can share this in the in the chat as well uh, with Paul. But in terms of the, uh, uh, when you're talking about that uh, uh, number of the project wise, we have done a number of projects, right? Uh, but we have actually also launched uh, right now uh, the peak report. Uh, what how do you manage uh, what the peak season is coming up? We love to share with the entire group. Uh, Darren. So, I mean, there is a lot of actually, we're putting a lot of insights out right now with working with a lot of agencies and also especially with Space 48. Just to educate, uh, the key one is that one thing, Darren, I wanted to even take uh, everyone's view because what we have seen is that over the last uh, 18 months, there are new customers coming on the websites, right? I mean, like the people who have not transacted before. How do you, I mean, this my question go to David and Michael as well. How do you manage the fraud in that element? So, these are the things which are like the retailers and a couple of, uh, uh, you know, the agencies are asking us that when these new people coming on the site who have never transacting, you don't even have a data. So how do you manage the fraud element of that? So the, the fraud element? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, fraud checks on the, on the checkout, really, isn't it? It's, um, it's not something that we have a lot of in the first place. Um, not sure why are we just lucky but uh, it, it's not something that we've had a problem with there's a small amount um but using the payment platforms that we use the the fraud checks have caught pretty much everything um, even uh, david even for the same because heels is such a luxury i mean it's such a brilliant brand uh, i mean so do you also have the same because we are actually working with a lot of technology as darren did mention about this thing that 
uh, we are actually focusing on how exactly we can prevent this going forward, especially in the scalability side in international and cross-border side of things, right? So just wanted to get your thoughts on when you see a new customer where you do not have any data, do you, do you, do you see all these type of things? Kind of a, how do you prevent that? Uh, I'm afraid it's a very boring answer, Deepak. We're much the same as Michael. We, um, and, and I has always hesitate to say this. I've, I've got a lot of wood in my vicinity here, which I'm touching furiously, but uh, we suffer from incredibly low levels of fraud. Our payment gateway uh, we consider to be extremely secure. And we have one very significant added to protection, which is there is normally a, a material lead time between the per the customer buying something and us actually sending it to them. So if fraud does get through on the rare occasions, um, it, it tends to be trapped. I mean, I, I'm, I'm to some extent more interested in, in, the, uh, in the profitability of acquiring new customers. That's a bigger deal for us. Um, clearly it's better for us if we can uh, bring existing customers back into the fray, but no, it, it, to be somewhat boring, fraud is not, very high up my, my list of, uh, of priorities. I've got many more things around the customer experience that uh, that I'm trying to focus on and improve. Um, uh, and and they tend to be focused on the, the brand experience. I guess people, if, you've, if you are a, a fraudulent shopper, then buying a large piece of furniture that is difficult to move and has in in david's case with their premium furniture th there's that aesthetic choice to make so it's going to be hard to sell on i happen to have this lovely crushed velvet sofa you've got to find someone who wants a crushed velvet yeah. sofa um so you know we're not naturally a target you you it is difficult um to deal with a super king mattress that's turned up on your doorstep right. uh, and and to to sell that on in, in a useful way who wants to buy a dodgy mattress yes. There's a bloke out the back in the car park at the Dog and Duck. He's got a really lovely heel sofa you can get for 50 quid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. It doesn't, doesn't quite work, does it? Yeah. And then on the other end of things, you know, where people are testing out, um, if you've got a stolen credit card, there's usually the model where you'll make some low value purchases to make sure the card's still active, something you're paying a deposit on. We're not in the target range for that. Um, I mean, previously I worked at Jet2 and that was um, a little bit more common than you'd expect because ultimately... Um, when someone's booked a holiday, you know, you have to put in your passport details and all that. So uh, things have to match up. But uh, it was a little bit, it, there, was a, there was a higher volume there, but we had, it was a massive organization, a massive turnover. So, you know, a full-time dedicated fraud management team was needed. So I've been at both ends of the spectrum, the, uh, the too big to solve it with your e-commerce platform and the too small to, for it to be a problem. Thank you, sir. Paul, I'm going to ask you this question, if I may. This is from Martin. Thank you, Martin. And Martin wants to discuss that consistency of experience for retailers with e common and bricks and mortar. So he's given an example at St. Argos, great example, but not currently delivering to its full potential. Yeah. And then Amazon developing into a B&M space, etc. How, how do retailers nail it? How do they get that consistency between the bricks and the clicks? I think a lot of a lot of the consistency there for me is actually about how you how you present the brand. You know, some trying to trying to keep those kind of core brand values throughout the experiences, but also adapting you know the execution of those experiences depending on the, you know the platform or device or physically in person or whatever. So you know you can still I, I know obviously with with Amazon they want everything to be as easy and as simple as possible. So. You know, they've got things like if you're logged into your Amazon account, you can go through checkouts, you know, with your, your phone in your pocket and it comes out of your, uh, the transaction comes off, off your kind of phone while it's in your pocket and you just kind of go through the checkout. So they're creating this more modern retail experience, which um, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not a massive expert on on kind of offline and, and, and physical spaces, but I do know that a lot of the clients that we work with that are multi-channel. Uh, so we have a lot of clients that have stores. So we might have a client that has maybe um, 40 stores as well as their online store. I do know that the, the shift of emphasis now or the sales, you know, whereas that client may have, you know, the online store might have been their 35th most performing um, store actually now post pandemic, it's actually probably in the top 10 in terms of, you know, revenue and turnover, if not top three. So 
I think the transition of trying to keep those brand values through your website is, is quite important, but a lot of the clients that we work with have more of a considered commerce journey. So um, I put it in the chat earlier, you know, the, there's a number of touch points before someone will make a decision to buy a piece of furniture or buy a shed or, you know, fencing or, um, you know, even stuff for the garden, you know, in terms of furniture or whatever. So I think that that level of consistent messaging throughout, but also knowing what each channel's purpose is for. So offline, like I said before, it play, it can play a really strong part in an emotive, in an emotive purchase and someone physically like understanding, you know, the, the size and depth of a product, particularly with these larger items. But then online acting more as the, right, let's get straight in, make it really easy to convert, um, you know, give all the product information and enrich the product detail page with some really good content to enable them to make the purchase. So I think we, we try to look at it as this journey where the website or the mobile site or, you know, the checkout or the product page is just one touch point within the journey. And I think making sure that you're considering that entire journey and how your brand is represented across that entire journey. For me, the brands that map that out the best are the, the brands that, you know, um, do the best job and succeed. Um, thank you for that, sir. And hopefully that answers your question, um, sir. So thank you uh, so much for asking it. We are coming into the last few minutes, actually. So I'm going to go around the panel for our closing questions. And I'm going to stay with you, Paul, if I may, actually. Yeah. Um, and just kind of give us your closing words around best practice. So real best practice for creating an online digital strategy for those people listening now that kind of know it's still something that they're either not doing that well or something they really need to get stuck into. What is your advice for current best practice around an online digital strap? So I've got a couple of things. I think some of the things have already been touched on and, and this isn't everything, but this is what comes up a lot with our clients and has done in the last six months or so. So really making sure that you've got a, a bigger picture plan. We do we run discovery sessions with clients and when we do that, we bring in third party tech partners like Big Commerce or, or maybe like a, a search provider like Clevery or Attract or someone like that where we bring in third parties and the stakeholders within the business. So we've got maybe the digital marketing agency, the e-com agency, the in-house team, bringing people together to really discover what, you know, what we need to achieve as a collective team and working together on that plan. Uh, following that, we always like to produce a really good roadmap, which is detailed. Sometimes people put in a roadmap, improve conversion rate. It's not good enough. You know, you need detail. We need really detailed actions for what we're going to achieve each quarter. So creating that really solid roadmap that does have flexibility that can change over time. But, you know, that, that is actually, you know, quite specific in its individual actions to deliver. Um, data led decisions, which was mentioned earlier, um, that for me is critical. Not enough people split test changes for a website before they put the request into the development agency. You know, save yourself time, save yourself budget, split test things in advance, make sure that they work and they increase conversion rate, then add it to your development backlog or your UX backlog further down the line, because that conversion rate and split testing, that upfront investment will save you a lot of money and a lot of time further down the line when it comes to your development uh, budget. Um, last two for me is not enough people are invested in their retention strategy. I want to say that Understanding customers, user surveys. I think Mike, Michael mentioned it earlier. Not enough people do user surveys and actually ask their customers what they want. And then once you find out what they want, create a content strategy that sits behind that and will support that. So if they have real issues figuring out sizes of mattresses or how does it fit fit the actual, um, you know, the, the base or the, or the uh, sheets that go over the top, create a guide for that, you know, create content for that. There'd be plenty of people who want to engage with that content. And then finally, like I said before, review your tech stack. Most people use something like Nosto just for a product recommendation on the PDP. It's this really powerful tool, but not everyone's using it to its maximum. Even platforms like Big Commerce, Magento, et cetera, you know, you need to look through with your agency and say, well, actually, is this tech stack now fit for purpose to go into 2022? And really ask the question, are we maximizing what we've got? Too many people focus on what they've not got and what should we do in the future? And they don't get the most out of, you know, what they've got today. So. Thank you, sir. And there's tons of content in there. So I'm sure yeah. if anyone wants to follow up with you, what's the best way of them getting a hold of you? Just paul at space48.com. Just give me a okay. share. Or, or, or find you on LinkedIn and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for being a brilliant panellist and thanks for your contribution and time today. Michael, continue this for us, this best practice theme. Anything that you'd like to add as your closing words? I think um, it's, it's understand how your users are going to consume what you're giving them. How, how tech literate are they? Um, how, don't try anything super duper new and in, in, innovative against a mass market potentially because you are likely dealing with quite a lot of customers who um, aren't as tech literate as your team that's coming up with these ideas and you need to make sure that it's accessible and it's responsive and it works. Page speed is, is a key thing. Google are pushing on that for a reason. You know, that page should be immediately available and shouldn't be causing frustrations to your customers. So if you are, um, if you're trialing tech that's that's throwing things in the customer's face, you really do need to do that split test. You need to see, uh, is the value of the information you're capturing that way outweighing the bounce rate you're causing as, as people throw their phone across the room in frustration? Because it's popped up an email sign-up form that they can't work out how to get rid of to look at the critical information that would have led to the conversion. So it's focusing on that, that user experience and how someone who isn't a digitally first person is going to deal with that uh, and the impact on that. Thank you, sir. It looks nice and sunny where you are now as well. Yeah, it's, it's just moving around to blind me completely. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, listen, thank you for joining us today. Your contribution has been amazing. And I'm glad the business is going uh, so well for you guys as well. Thank you for your time. Uh, Deepak, give us some closing words. I want to really just, just run this best practice theme through to our close. What's your, uh, what's your advice? I, I'll just say two things. One is uh, data, right? Just, just learn. Uh, learn about what exactly has happened. Uh, would 2020 be, be the same? Uh, just learn 2019, 2020, what exactly has changed? learn from the data and make changes on the basis of that. I agree with Paul about the tech stack. You should, de should definitely, whether it's big commerce or any other e-commerce technology, just, just check that. And also I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that the brands now should start thinking about moving from a transactional commerce to an aspirational commerce. Think about this, how you can add loyalty, how you can add stickiness, how you can add retention. Uh, like, so all those type of things are very, very important because I think if you keep on doing the transactional by giving them the promotions and all these type of things, you are here today, might not be there tomorrow because some competitor would be there. Becoming an aspirational brand where people like heels and mattress online and all. So people like to go there and just buy the product. They have a uniqueness. So I think you, every brand should start thinking about that. And do they have the right technology to do that? That's also another question, right? So I would say that two things, uh, data and thinking about how you can retain uh, the existing one and add new and bring loyalty. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your contribution as well. Been great to have you here and look forward to inviting you back to future panels. David, uh, you're, you're going to be our wrapper of the event, please. So um, wrap it up for us with your thoughts on uh, best practice and some closing words, please. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and be as concise as possible. I think uh, just to take on board what Deepak said there is don't, don't try and out Amazon Amazon. Yeah, you, you're not going to be able to do it there brilliant at you know everything they do so just try and do whatever it is you do as as well as you possibly can and in the case of almost everybody um let's say moving from that transactional approach to a more emotional approach is absolutely essential think of yourself as a brand and think what it is you can do online that presents yourself as a brand and presents that brand in the most compelling, attractive, desirable, aspirational way possible. Content, photography, the look and feel of the website. This, this is the only way in which uh, retailers are gonna survive in the future is by thinking themselves as a brand and establishing emotion, an emotional collection. The technology is important, but it's not the most important thing. Thank you so much. And uh, great to have you with us again back on the further panel. And uh, we love Heels. It's great to have such a heritage brand uh, on the panel with us today as well. That's a wrap. Oh, by the way, Martin, your question was answered even uh, more fully by David in text as well. So hopefully you've seen that in the chat before we, uh, we close off the webinar. And thanks for that, David. Um, right. That is a wrap, really. Um, we've done really a full hour there. Thank you so much to uh, these gentlemen. Um, I really appreciate your time. Deepak, Paul, Michael, David. Thank you to Louise for her early appearance earlier on again as well. We're taking a short break now um, and we are back at midday with our closing panel of the day. We're having a, a compressed morning session today. So 
Um, our next panel is at 12 o'clock. Uh, we'll be talking about leveraging data to drive digital, that big D word that we need to unpack. Um, but thanks again, gents. Uh, brilliant webinar. Thanks for your time. And I'll see you all back here at 12 noon. Have a great time.